it's interesting. Each time I've been through this, there's always been new information and new updates and uh, and new insights into into this this book of Revelation. The thing I find fascinating lately: the current events in the world are leading up to and gradually approaching the time of the events recorded in this book. We're not there yet, but we're approaching it, and I believe approaching it fast. And tonight we're going to cover two aspects, a, preview, a little bit of a preview to the book, and then an introduction as well to the, to the book. We'll cover the first three verses of Revelation 1. And the, uh, the book, uh, the Bible, the, the, uh, the Bible that I'm using for reference purposes is the New American Standard Bible. So if you have other versions, uh, if you find it's different than what I'm using, uh, the reason I'm using the New American Standard is because it's the closest word-by-word -word, uh, translation from the original languages into the, into the English language. So before we start, let's just open in a word of prayer. Father, we give you thanks for this day, Lord, and we thank you so much for your word. And this book of Revelation, thank you, Lord, that it has formed part of Scripture. And as we look into it, we are totally dependent upon your spirit to guide us into your truth. And so, Father, I pray that as we look into your word, and as we're guided by the Spirit, Lord, may our spirits be enriched in the knowledge of what you have for us in the future. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Written by the Apostle John around 95 AD, it is possible that the provision of a copy would have been made for each of the seven churches, with each church therefore having its own copy. In fact, Robert L. Thomas, in his commentary, reasons that quite possibly there were seven messengers from the seven churches who attended Patmos to visit with John while he was in exile as a prisoner of uh, Rome under the Roman Emperor Domitian. And this visit occasioned the sending of the book to each of the seven churches, with each messenger being given a copy to be kept and read to his respective church. Whether a single copy or seven copies, the entire book would have been received and accepted by those seven churches as it was received in its entirety, thus giving the circulation of the book and its contents a good start right from the get-go in those seven churches found in Asia Minor, which is today modern-day Turkey. However, it was slow in gaining universal recognition of the church in general outside those seven churches. Thus, reception of the book into the body of Scripture was slow in being adopted. And one of the reasons for a slower acceptance arose primarily from the unusual language and character of the book, the only book in the New Testament describing in difficult yet colorful and explicit detail the events of the times leading up to Christ's return to this earth. The other difficulty in its slow acceptance was the teaching of the thousand-year reign of Christ on this earth is expressly taught in Revelation 20. Although the reign of God's appointed Messiah on earth was predicted in both Old Testament and New Testament books, nowhere was there anything mentioned about a thousand year reign of Christ except here. Nowhere else in scripture is there a time limit placed on, its, <clears throat> on his rule on this present earth. This teaching in Revelation 20 still finds its opponents today even among recognized conservative biblical scholars. But the fact is that the early church accepted Revelation as God's word to the churches, and by the end of the second century, with disputes and objections resolved, by the working of the Holy Spirit in the minds and the hearts of the leading church fathers, Revelation was recognized for what it truly is, the word of God, and was admitted into the canon of scripture. The theme of the book, Right at the outset, outset, verse 1 of chapter 1 states the theme of the book of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's a book that reveals Jesus Christ. It tells us things about him that we would not otherwise know, in particular details leading up to and concerning his second coming to this earth from heaven. 
the nature of the book. In uh, Revelation 1-3, uh, John records these words, actually they're right from his, uh, his pen and from his mind. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. The nature of the book is principally one of prophecy, where God reveals to us his knowledge of things as they are with his churches in the world through the, throughout the current church age, which we're going to be covering later on when we come to chapters 2 and 3, and of the things which are yet to take place in the world after the church age comes to a close. And I will cover chapters 4 to 22. Seven times in the book of Revelation, the noun prophecy appears. In chapter 1, verse 3, chapter 11, verse 6, chapter 19, verse 10, chapter 22, verses 7, 10, 18, and 19. So it can be safely reasoned that the nature and character of the book of Revelation is primarily one of prophecy. In uh, Revelation 22, verse 7, and 10, 18, and 19, the book is specifically referred to as the words of the prophecy of this book. So it's a book of prophecy. Much of, much of, the, uh, of what is recorded in the book of Revelation has not occurred as yet, and is yet to, be, yet to happen in the future. And the question is, well, is prophecy a significant and important part of the Bible? Prophecy accounts for a major portion of the entire canon of Scripture. Numerous books of the Old Testament contain prophecies within their pages, and some are entirely prop prophetic in nature. Some include short-range declarations about the future, and others contain declarations far off in the future from the time that they were written. Many prophecies have already been fulfilled, and yet there is a considerable amount of God's prophetic word which remains yet to be fulfilled. In the New Testament, almost every book contains some element that is pro prophetic in nature. The book of Revelation stands out by itself in that it is almost wholly devoted to words and visions that are prophetic in nature. From chapter 4 to the end of the book, the events recorded are prophetic from our standpoint in time and have as yet to happen. It's interesting. According to the Encyclopedia of uh, Biblical Prophecy, about 27% of scripture is predictive in nature. And this means that over one-fourth of the Bible, more than one in four verses, was prophetic at the time it was written. On top of that is the amazing accuracy of those prophesied events which have come to pass. The prophecy about the first coming of Christ alone, when you go through the the Old Testament prophecies concerning Christ's first coming. It's amazing how deadly accurate those prophecies were when they were actually filled when Christ came the first time. And at least half of all biblical predictions have already been fulfilled, precisely as God declared they would be. And because of God's faithfulness in fulfilling these prophecies in the past, we can rest assured that He will fill, fulfill, fulfill those prophecies yet to be fulfilled in the future. So if we look back in the prophecies that have been fulfilled in the past and the accuracy with which they've been fulfilled, when we look at the things that haven't happened yet, we can with all confidence state and rest in the fact that they will be fulfilled. And the Old and New Testament have a particular significance to the book of Revelation Interesting, of the 404 verses of Revelation, 278 allude to Old Testament scriptures. Although there are no direct formal reference quotations from the Old Testament found in this book, nevertheless the book of Revelation draws the reader's attention to the Old Testament like no other book in the New Testament. The principal allusions are to Daniel, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Zechariah, and the Psalms. And it takes some study and work, but these references are vital and essential in coming to an understanding of the meaning of the many pictures and symbols found in the book. And as we go through the book of Revelation, we're going to be referring back to those Old Testament books to get an understanding especially of the pictures and the symbols that are portrayed in 
the book of Revelation. Besides the Old Testament, there are also allusions to two to New Testament books. The book of Revelation adds to and clarifies our understanding concerning much of what is written about future things in other New Testament books, including Matthew, especially chapter 24, the book of Luke, the letter of Paul to the Romans, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Colossians, Ephesians, 1st and 2nd Peter, and James. So although there's no direct quotations, yet the allusions to the scripture that's already been given at the time that John wrote this, the, the book of Revelation uh, are there for us to, to, to look back on and, and gain an understanding of what John is talking about in his book. There are basically two methods of ter interpretation to any body of literature, speculative and substantive. A speculative theory is a theory that lacks in and wants for provable ev evidence. It has no basis in fact, no factual basis upon which to prove its theory to be true. The reader draws numerous and oftentimes spurious understandings and meanings and conclusions virtually to the exclusion of the intention of the writer. The reader thus controls the meaning and narrative to the exclusion of the original and genuine intent of the writer. So we've got to be careful whenever we're going through any, any literature, it's incumbent upon us to understand what the intent and the original and genuine intent of the writer was. Otherwise, we're going to end up speculating about what that writer intended to do. And the second theory of interpretation is substantive. A substantive theory is a theory founded on and substantiated by solid evidence and real facts. In literature, the reader seeks fervently to understand the intended meaning and view of the writer. The writer controls the meaning and narrative for the reader to seek and gain an understanding of the writer's intent and meaning. So do you see the difference between the two? One, the reader is, is interpreting the narrative. The other is the, the reader is trying to understand and seek the meaning that the writer intended. For our study, we want to let the author control the narrative and meaning of what is being conveyed in writing. As readers and students, it's our desire and indeed our duty to, to seek to understand as much as is possible the meaning and the intent of what the author is communicating in the book of Revelation. And that's where we're going. That's our duty and that's what we want to do, is to seek what the author means in that book. There are five important rules for interpreting, for interpreting prophecy in God's Word. Number one, interpret prophecy literally when the literal sense makes sense. Number two, when interpreting figures and symbols, look first for built inter interpretations. For example, Jesus reveals to John the meaning of the seven lampstands as seven churches, and the seven stars he holds in his right hand as the angels or messengers of the seven churches. And we'll be coming to that as we go through Revelation chapter, chapter 1. But built, the built-in interpretation of those two things, the lampstands and the stars, are already incorporated in chapter 1 of Revelation. So that's not difficult to understand, the metaphor. Thirdly, look to other portions of Scripture and compare parallel passages to discover the meaning of other pictures and symbols. And of particular help in understanding Revelation is the book of Daniel. And we're going to be making reference to the book of Daniel often as we go through this book of Revelation. Be aware of time intervals and prophetic passages. Some Old Testament passages in a single verse can refer to two different events with a space and time between the occurrences of the two events. And what it would look like would be like this. It's almost like two mountains. One prophecy, one event could be here, but <clears throat> when you read it, it looks like it's a straight line that there's no, there's no gap in time at all between the two. But there's one part of it that happens soon, and another part of it that happens later. So beware of the intervals in 
prophetic passages. passages. And also, number five, distinguish between fulfilled and unfulfilled prophecies. Since the time they were written, some prophecies have already been fulfilled from our standpoint in time. But there are numerous prophecies yet to be fulfilled as we look forward to the future and from our own time today. And there are five basic approaches to interpreting the book of Revelation. There is the reductionist. This is perhaps the most common approach and is found in many, if not all, Christian creeds. It's a simplified and generalized statement declaring the return of Christ, but omits or neglects the details and the events surrounding his return as revealed in the book of Revelation. Much of the prophetic scripture concerned with the coming of Christ is ignored and or simply overlooked. And perhaps the reason for this was, and is, to avoid division in the church concerning differences of interpretation in the doctrine of Christ's second coming, especially when it comes to interpreting portions of First and Second Thessalonians in the book of Revelation. And if you go through any of the creeds, they, they acknowledge the return of Christ, but then they ignore a lot of the detail recorded in the Old Testament scriptures as well as the book of Revelation, and First and Second Thessalonians too. So that's a reductionist. It's kind of a generalized, Christ is going to come back, end of story. Then there's the preterist. This approach treats the prophecies of Revelation as having already occurred and fulfilled in the early history of the church of the first century. They regard the record of events in the book of Revelation as dealing with the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in 70 AD. The problem with that is that the description of the events recorded in Revelation cannot, com cannot compare to what happened in 70 AD. The wrath of God that's poured out in the book of Revelation is, is horrendous compared to what happened to the temple and to Jerusalem in 70 AD. In fact, Jesus said there was there come a time when, uh, like no other in the history of the world when it comes to the, the wrath of God being poured out. Then there's the idealist. The idealist approaches the book of Revelation as a pictorial unfolding of great principles in the ongoing struggle between good and evil. Revelation to the idealist is an allegory holding only a spiritual message, ending in God's triumph over evil and his ultimate reign of righteousness on this earth for all eternity. To the idealist, revelation cannot be interpreted in any literal sense and has no reference to actual events. And then the historist, historicist. The historicist views the book of Revelation as portraying a panorama of church history from the days of John to the return of Christ, and I'd emphasize that church history. Eventually, the world will become Christianized through missionary efforts and evangelism, and thus be made ready for Christ's return. And as we know, the, as the world continues on, uh, apart from Christ's reign, things are not getting better, and they're only going to get worse. So, the fact, <laughs> Christianizing the world, I don't think, is going to happen until Christ returns. <laughs> And then there's the Futurist. The Futurist views most of the book from chapters 4 to 22 as prophecy yet to be fulfilled. This view takes a literal approach and claims that the figurative and symbolic language has meaning which can be interpreted in a meaningful and understandable way. And the approach we will be using in this study in the book of Revelation is the Futurist because we, I believe that all of the events are, from the chapter 4 to 22 are yet to, yet to happen. So we're going to only cover the first three verses tonight. <clears throat> I've laid out a, uh, an outline for the from the first eight verses for the, as far as the introduction to the Revelation is concerned. These eight verses made up of three parts introduce us to the book and to its theme. There's the preface, and we'll be covering the five items under that tonight. 
and then the salutation and the announcement will be covering those next week plus we'll probably be able to get into and on into uh, from verse 9 <coughs> on as well depending on the time element so the preface verse the first three verses of chapter 1 the revelation of Jesus Christ by the way if anybody has any questions or comments please feel free to raise your hand or speak up okay the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants the things which must soon take place. And he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bondservant John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. First of all, the title of the book in verse 1a of chapter 1. The revelation of who? Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. And the word for revelation in the Greek is apocalypsis, from which we get our English word apocalypse. And it means a revelation or a disclosure or an unveiling of something which was previously concealed or hidden. Daniel, the prophet Daniel, was told by the angel Michael. He says, go your way, Daniel. And this is after he was, it was revealed to Daniel certain events concerning the end times. And Daniel had a hard time understanding, and he wanted to know. But Michael came back and told him, said, go your way, Daniel, for these words dealing with the end times are what? Concealed and sealed up until the end time. Daniel chapter 12, verse 9. The book of Revelation is the unsealing and the unveiling of the words that were concealed and sealed up to Daniel in his day. So we have the benefit in our day of knowing and having the knowledge of those things that <laughs> were sealed up and hidden from Daniel. We're in a blessed time to have that. The term until the end of time is striking and meaningful in that the things we have revealed in the book of Revelation signifies that we are in fact living in the end times. The second thing to note <clears throat> is the preposition of. The preposition of can have two possible meanings or can be taken <coughs> in two possible senses. It can mean that the revelation is about Jesus Christ, and it can also mean that the revelation is from Jesus Christ. And both can be applied to the phrase, the revelation of Jesus Christ. For the subject and content of revelation is not only about Jesus, but the source of the revelation also comes from Jesus. The important thing to note, however, is that the revelation deals with the unveiling of Jesus Christ as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Revelation 19 is a pivotal, is a pivotal chapter. This chapter deals with that momentous event of Christ's personal return to this earth. And as important as this chapter is, chapter 19, the complete book of Revelation also includes details of events which happened prior to and leading up to Revelation 19, the coming of the Lord, and then after that, deal, <clears throat> de details of ensuing events which, which happen following and subsequent to, to Revelation 19. So when we come to Revelation 19, it's the coming of the Lord in almighty power. All of the, the events leading up to chapter 20, uh, up to chapter 19, are recorded and then after that there's a record of the events after the return of Christ. So it covers a whole broad spectrum of time and then even on into eternity. And then the communication of the book verses 1b and 1d of chapter 1 the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants. And he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bondservant, John. The ultimate source of the book of Revelation is God the Father. The flow of communication is from God the Father to his son, Jesus Christ, with Christ's bondservants as the ultimate destination of the contents of the book of Revelation. 
So it's something that the God the Father wants the bond, his bond servants to know. It comes from God the Father, and the ultimate destination is God's bond servants, the church. <clears throat> the word bond servants refers to all members of Christ's body, the church, as epitomized by the seven churches in chapters 2 and 3, and we'll be covering those and the, dif and the dif difficulties that they faced or the problems they faced, and also some of the blessings too in those churches. But it also refers to and is used of those who come to faith in Christ and in God's word after the church age ends, during the tribulation period as disclosed in chapters 4 to the end of the book. When the rapture occurs, the church age comes to an end, and then there's a period of time after that uh, when the Antichrist signs a, uh, a peace, peace agreement with Israel. And that's when the seven years, the clock begins, the first sand of time begins the moment that the Antichrist signs the uh, agreement, the peace agreement with, with Israel. The church at that point in time is raptured, it's gone to be with the Lord in heaven. We're going to be covering that as well, the rapture and the resurrection of the church. Since revelation is something God gave to Christ, the question might be raised, well, does Jesus not know the content of the revelation? And the answer, in Matthew 24, he goes through great detail about his knowledge of the tribulation period. So the answer to the question is, yes, he does know. But in Matthew 24, 36, regarding the signs of his coming, Jesus himself says, Of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. Thus, it, it's not a question of what Christ knows about the events of the end times, but rather one of the timing as to when the events of Revelation are to occur. That timing apparently is in the private counsel of God the Father. He knew when the time was right for the book of Revelation to be written and shown to Christ's bondservants, around 95 AD, and he also knows when the time is right for the events of the book of Revelation to begin to take place as yet to occur. So that's all in the counsel of the Father. The timing, the events, Jesus knows all about the events, but God has his finger on the, on the timing when they're going to occur. So the intermediaries between God the Father and Christ's bond servants are Jesus, who then gives the revelation to his angel, who in turn gives it to John, who, to give to Christ's bond servants. Thus the flow of communication of God's word of revelation is from God the Father to Jesus Christ, to his angel, to John, and then to Christ's bondservants. John MacArthur makes an interesting observation about angels. And this is what he, he wrote in his uh, commentary. <clears throat> the book of Revelation is unique in the New Testament literature because it's the only book sent and communicated to its human author by angels. In Revelation 22:16, Jesus reaffirmed the truth taught here, declaring, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you, to you these things for the churches. Angels were involved in the giving of the book of Revelation to John, just as they were involved in giving the law to Moses. After the letters to the seven churches, angels played a prominent role in the subsequent scenes depicted in the book of Revelation and in communicating the truths of Revelation to John. In fact, twice, John falls down at the, at the presence of an angel on his knees to worship him. And the, the angel both times says, don't do that. I'm, I'm a servant just as you are. The subject of the book, verse 1c, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bond servants, the things which must soon take place. The things refer to all the things disclosed in the book of Revelation. Notice the verb must take place. This indicates that there is the unquestionable and absolute necessity that they do take place. This isn't the only time that the phrase the things that must happen occurs in scripture in reference to the end times. The phrase is first alluded to by Daniel in his description and interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream about the great statue 
as recorded in Daniel 2. The statue stands for four kingdoms, and the stone cut without hands out of the mountain that destroys the statue stands for an everlasting kingdom that will destroy the four. And those four kingdoms are Gentile kingdoms that have rule and authority over the nation of Israel. Jesus also uses the same phrase in his Olivet Discourse with his disciples in Matthew 24, dealing with end time events. These things, he says, must happen. And the same phrase is used in Revelation 4.1 at the beginning of the portion of the book of Revelation where God pours out his wrath on this earth and is specifically apocalyptic in nature. It's found again in Revelation 22.6 right at the end of the book, at the conclusion of the main body of the book. Thus, the events recorded in Revelation 4.1 to 22.5 are marked out as comprising those things that must happen. So when we go through the book of Revelation, beware the fact that these things are going to take place because they have to take place. But also, take note of the, uh, of the adverb soon, the things which must soon take place. There are two thoughts concerning this word soon, and the Greek, worm, Greek term is entakai, and that's where we get the word tachometer from, from the uh, Greek word tachai. One thought makes it descriptive of the speed with which the events of Revelation will be carried out. They will occur in rapid-fire sequence, or speedily, once they begin to happen. The second thought is the word soon means that the events of Revelation are imminent and can happen at any time when one does not expect them, soon. Soon then puts the hearer on notice that the beginning of the events is close at hand. Even though some 1900 years have passed since the book of Revelation was written, the events recorded therein can begin to happen at any time. Christ's bond servants should therefore be ready and prepared to respond to the warnings, the admonitions, and the comforts as provided to them in the book. And then the testimony of John in verse 2. To his bondservant John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. John now adds his own certification to what he has heard and seen as recorded in the book of Revelation. This part of the preface, and probably the whole preface, may have been written after John heard and saw all the events recorded in the book of Revelation. Like any good author of an historical event, it includes a personal preface at the start to indicate the author's personal role in the knowledge about which he is writing. Thus, at the outset, John states his role as witness to the Word of God, which he heard with his own ears, and to the person of Jesus Christ whom he saw with his own eyes. Not only that, but he also declares his role as witness to all that he saw and recorded in this marvelous book of Revelation. So there he's certifying what he had heard and what he had seen, what he heard with his ears and what he had seen with his eyes. And then we come finally to the blessing of the book in verse 3. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy, and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. No book in the Bible holds the promise of blessing like the book of Revelation. It opens with a promised blessing in verse 3 of chapter 1 and closes with a similar blessing in verse 7 of chapter 22. Altogether, there are seven blessings pronounced in the book, and it's the same word used by our Lord in his sermon on the mount in Matthew chapter 5, which we covered last year, last uh, summer. So, in the text above, there are three conditions necessary to receive the promised blessing. Number one, blessed is he who reads. First, the blessing is promised to those who read the words of the prophecy. The reader here is no doubt the angel or messenger to the church who is given a copy of the book of Revelation to read to his congregation. His duty was to read the book publicly in the church. And in those early days of the church, before the printing press was invented, 
a limited number of handwritten copies, in this case seven at the most in all probability, made it necessary for the material to be read. Not everyone in the church had a, had a copy. Not everyone would have a copy as we do today. For those who could read, there was probably a single copy available in the church for their reference. Here the promised blessing is not only for the hearer, but for the reader as well. For us today, with copies readily available, there is a blessing promised for us who take up this book and read it. <laughs> we don't have the same problem <laughs> they had in those days. Their library consisted probably of a couple of books, and this would have been one of them. Sure. Maybe some of the letters of Paul, mm -hmm. and pro perhaps the Old Testament. But the, uh, the number of copies was very, 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 very small. Secondly, blessed are those who hear. Secondly, the blessing is promised to those who hear the words of this prophecy. It takes an ear that is open, attentive, and receptive to the words being read. In this case, the very words of God from heaven. This admonition to, <clears throat> to hear is of such tremendous importance that it appears at the very beginning and the end of the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 3, and then chapter 22, 18, at the end. So they, at that time in the church, the, uh, the scriptures were read. As Remember, uh, Paul instructed Timothy to be attentive to the reading of scripture in the church. And then, thirdly, blessed are those who heed or keep. Thirdly, the blessing is promised to those who not only read and hear, but who heed the things written in the words of the prophecy. The sense of the word to heed or to keep is to observe the words of Revelation in such a way that our pro practical conduct is governed by them. Heeding and keeping the words of Revelation means to walk in obedience to them. When I first read the book of Revelation, I tried to read it out loud. I got about to the, to the eighth verse of chapter one, and I couldn't read out loud the rest of the book. My voice was just shaking. So I ended up reading the rest of it in her privately in silence. And to be honest with you, it was probably the book that brought me to faith in Christ more than any other. Mainly because the fear of the Lord just struck my heart. And I realized how da what danger I was in in not receiving him and receiving this word. And then since then, <clears throat> the book of Revelation has been a fascinating book. It's probably the book I've read the most, studied the most, and taught the most, is the book of Revelation. But every time, there's always something new. And there's always refreshing thoughts that come. And, uh, and I'm sure it's going to happen here, too. The first two times are good, the third time is probably better still. <laughs> But I guess the point I'm trying to make too is that when you read through this book, don't be discouraged, but be encouraged to try to find out what this book is, is all about. James offers this wise counsel in his letter. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, in humility receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. But prove yourselves doers of the word, and not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in the mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of a person he was. I don't know about you, when I walk by a mirror, and <laughs> I take a look, I try to look away as fast as possible. <laughs> I want to forget what that image is like. <laughs> but one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. So what James is saying is, yes, hear it, yes, read it, yes, hear it, but make sure that you're doing what it's telling you to do. 
and to close out his admonition to read, hear, and heed the words of the prophecy in the book of Revelation, he then warns of the urgency to do so, for the time is near. This nearness of time refers to the revelation or appearing of Jesus Christ and the coming fulfillment of the prophecies written in this book. John Walbert wrote these words in his commentary in Revelation. The next great event on God's prophetic calendar, the imminent return of Jesus Christ in the air to rapture his church, is near from the standpoint of prophetic revelation, and it could occur at any moment. Thus, there is an immediate and ongoing urgency for the believer to repent of sin, to be obedient, and to be waiting and watching for the Lord's return. So that starts, that's the start, we're off, boy, we're off to a good start, 45 minutes. Wow. Any questions, comments? How many here, this is the first time you've been through this, be going through this book? First time. Okay, I only went through part, part of it. Part of it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Part of it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I encourage you to uh, continue on. It's, uh, it's a fascinating book, and it's very, very pertinent to the day in which we're living today. And, uh, and as the events in this world begin to unfold, I think what's here is pretty close at hand. So, no questions, no comments? Let's close in the word of prayer. Father, we give you thanks for your word, Lord, and as we look into it in the days that lie ahead, we pray, Lord, that we would be admonished to give our lives to you as much as we possibly can. May we be sensitive to the leading of your Spirit in our lives and be obedient to his call on each one of us. I pray, Lord, that you would grant us understanding into your word and uh, just be a real, may this be a real blessing as, as is promised in this verse 3 of the first chapter and at the close of the, the book as well. We give you thanks for this time, Lord, and dismiss us now with your blessing, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.